tonight, as you know, uh, Professor Friedman uh, is going to address uh, United States-Israel relations, and the original title was after the U.S. withdrawal from Syria. <laughs> and now we have after the change in our view of international law and settlements, <laughs> and after the indictment this afternoon of <laughs> Mr. Netanyahu, uh, the, the uh, well, not, not only that, P Professor Friedman has a co-edited book, an edited book, uh, due out this spring on uh, Netanyahu and U.S. relations and uh, uh, politics and foreign policy. Uh, so it's probably too late to have the latest footnote, <laughs> but he's assured me that he's covered in a general statement in his epilogue. Uh, but the Middle East is endlessly and frustratingly complicated, and the ball game changes a little bit constantly. Uh, you can argue that American interests are pretty constant, uh, but the situation really uh, uh, is subject to great, great change. So we're delighted to have uh, Professor Friedman with us. As uh, so many of you know him, uh, he is a professor emeritus from the Baltimore Hebrew University, where he was a uh, political scientist for many years and also president of that institution for a period of time in its later years. He's now a visiting professor at Johns Hopkins where he uh, teaches uh, Russian foreign policy and uh, the Arab-Israeli uh, crisis. Uh, Bob is a, a, a truly distinguished scholar. Uh, he uh, has written five books on uh, the uh, on Russian foreign affairs and affairs in general. He's a student of both Russia and uh, the Middle East. Uh, he's also edited or co-edited uh, 14 volumes on both Arab-Israeli relations and, uh, and Russia-Soviet relations. Um, it's a, uh, I think, an interesting pattern which he's followed. And we do have to thank him because he's probably, he's first spoke here during the 1980-81 season. Now, you won't believe that Bob's that old, but he, but he did. And uh, he spoke in every, every several years here since, for which uh, the council is truly grateful. And the Middle East keeps coming up with something new for him. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania with his degree in diplomatic history. His master's and PhD are both from Columbia University in international relations. Uh, in addition to his uh, publications, which are widespread, he's been a consultant for the State Department, the CIA. He's gone on American delegations abroad on a number of occasions. He was uh, part of a group sponsored, I think, by Brookings, which after 9-11, uh, sent a uh, delegation, he was the American representative, to talks with Europeans about what to do in the Middle East uh, following 9-11. Uh, there are other things which he's done which are, are uh, notable, and of course he's been a commentator. Uh, he's been on uh, uh, public NPR, uh, BBC, uh, Radio Moscow, uh, <laughs> And, and uh, the Arab station in London as well. Um, he's uh, addressed the uh, uh, foreign ministry of uh, Israel and uh, the defense ministry of Israel as well. Uh, so he shared his knowledge uh, widely. And he's good enough to share it with us as well. Uh, so it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce a trustee of the council, a very good friend of the council, Professor Robert Friedman. Thank you very much, Frank. I want to just take a minute also to recognize Frank. I know how many of you know that he's been leading the council for 40 years. Four decades. And he has really brought up, I think, the level of knowledge of foreign affairs in Baltimore. So I want to thank Frank as well. Okay. Tonight I want to deal with three things. The first is looking at the legacy of Barack Obama. Uh, 
Barack Obama has had some critiques in many communities as far as his policy toward the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Middle East as a whole, but I want to concentrate just on his legacy for the Middle East. And then I want to go into uh, current President Trump's policy toward the Arab-Israeli conflict. And the third and final section of the paper, and I'm going to leave lots of time for questions, deals with the future. The future now that Mr. Trump is under indictment in his way, and as Frank mentioned, that uh, Mr. Netanyahu is also under indictment. So I will share with you three scenarios, but let me get to one at a time. All right, let's start with the Obama administration. Uh, opponents of the Obama administration have argued that what Barack Obama did was essentially throw Israel under the bus, the arguments being by making this deal with the Iranians, by not vetoing a UN Security Council resolution condemning Israel for settlements, he's really turned out to be an enemy of Israel. I would suggest that's rather simplistic reasoning. Uh, let me deal first with the clashes between Obama and Israel, and then also the benefits that Obama brought to Israel. Two main issues. First was the JCPOA nuclear agreement with Iran. As you may remember, Mr. Trump, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, came to speak before Congress denouncing this agreement. And the basic elements of the agreement was it limited Iran's ability to enrich uranium. It limited the advanced centrifuges to spin the uranium into nuclear bomb-type fuel. And it also set up a very strict inspection system for the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency. Now, there were weaknesses, one of which it didn't limit the missiles, the ground-to-ground -ground missiles that uh, Iran had, and also after a certain number of years, 10, 20, 30, it gave the Iranians an outside chance to get nuclear weapons. So this was, that's the critique of it. However, I should mention in this case that the vast majority of Israel's security community, generals, admirals, etc., supported the JCPOA because it kept Iran for a relatively long period from getting nuclear weapons. So within the security community, Netanyahu was in the minority. The second issue was, of course, settlements. We need to spend a few minutes about talking about the settlements because, as you know, I think everybody in this room knows, just a few days ago, they were legalized by uh, Secretary of State Pompeo. Uh, here, here's the issue. If there's going to be a two-state solution, to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Okay, there needs to be a viable Palestinian state. But every time you have an Israeli settlement on the West Bank, it has a habit of growing. Uh, I have walked the West Bank myself many a time, and if there's a hill over there with a settlement, and a hill over here with an outpost, they have a habit of growing together to make a larger settlement. And this, of course, makes it less and less possible to have a viable Palestinian state. Now, this was a very hot issue between Obama and Netanyahu almost from the beginning, when they both took office in 2009. It's reached its peak, however, in 2016, because at that time, after the election of Mr. Trump as president, David N. Friedman, no relation to me, uh, who was the president's advisor uh, on Israel and the Middle East, basically told the Israelis right after the election, oh, no pressure, go ahead, build settlements, build settlements. And they did that. They built settlements. They expanded existing ones. They took the settlement outposts and, and legalized them. And that was, of course, the, the final thing for the Obama administration. And I just want to read to you what Secretary of State Kerry said to justify the non-veto of the UN Security Council resolution. 
I advised Prime Minister Netanyahu repeatedly that further settlement activities only invited UN action. Yet the settlement activity only increased, including advancing the unprecedented legislation to legalize settler outposts that the Israeli Prime Minister himself reportedly warned could expose Israel to action at the Security Council and even international prosecution before he decided to support it. In the end, we could not in good conscience protect the most extreme elements of the settler movement as it tries to destroy the two-state solution. We may not be able to stop them, but we cannot be expected to defend them. And it's certainly not the role of any country to vote against its own policies. This is why we decided not to block the UN Security Council resolution that makes this very clear. Okay, so you have two issues. Now, it's sometimes forgotten that President Obama gave more military aid to Israel than any other president in American history. In 1987, George W. Bush signed a 10-year, $3 billion a year agreement to, a pro to provide Israel with advanced military equipment. President Obama, despite some serious economic problems at home in 2009 when he took office, continued this and actually upped it by giving almost a quarter of a billion dollars in Iron Dome anti-missile missile aid to the Israelis that turned out to be very, very helpful to them during the war between Hamas and Israel in 2014. Then, of course, in 2016, President Obama signed another 10-year agreement, this time upping military aid to Israel to $3.8 billion a year. This is not throwing Israel under the bus. I should also mention that when he visited Israel in 2013, uh, right after he was reelected, he gave a speech, and in, those were, in the speech he said, if Israel is threatened, and I'll use the Hebrew and then translate it, atem lo levad, you are not alone. Now, I say this, and I want to emphasize this tonight, because Michael Oren, some of you may remember him as being the ambassador from Israel to the United States, raised the question just a month ago after President Trump abruptly ended the alliance with the Kurds and pulled the American troops out of northern part of Syria and said, you know, we could count on Obama to help us in, terms, in time of crisis. I'm just not sure if we can count on Trump. So I want to say that despite disputes over the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear agreement, and despite disputes over settlements, on balance, President Obama was, I think, a good friend to Israel. Now let's talk about President Trump. When President Trump was elected, I think Mr. Netanyahu thought he had died and gone to heaven. <laughs> now why do I say this? I say this because from the beginning, right after the election, this fellow David Friedman said, go, build settlements. And as I mentioned, he did. And then right after the election, uh, he's invited to the White House. And it's a warm and friendly agreement, some of you, a meeting. Some of you may have seen this uh, on TV. It's BB and Donald and, and good friends here, but still, Initially, perhaps under the influence of then Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, well, that's what Nikki Haley, the former UN ambassador, has argued in her new book, Trump was very cautious. He said, look, let's not push the settlements very much because, you know, it's hurting the peace process. And at the time, the president was working on the deal of the century, right? <laughs> this was going to settle the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He had his son-in-law, Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt, working together for it. So that was one. Then when Netanyahu asked, well, can we move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, he said, well, Trump said, we have to study this. So initially, interestingly enough, this was the cautious period. Uh, Mattis was the Secretary of Defense. Tillerson, with experience in the Middle East, 
was the Secretary of State, and it was come. However, things changed by the end of the year. Uh, Tillerson's position was weakened, and President Trump announced he's moving the embassy to uh, Jerusalem on May of 2018, which just happened to be the anniversary, 70th anniversary of the establishment of the State of Israel. So this was the first major thing. And I should mention, who did he have speak and offer prayers at the inauguration of the new embassy? Two evangelical Christians <laughs> who had not spoken very positively about Judaism in the past. But evangelical Christians are a major base for Trump. And this was President Trump's way of paying them back. But very soon, President Trump did a number of other things that had to make the Israelis happy. Uh, he cut American aid to UNRWA, which provides aid to the Palestinian refugees. He argued it just perpetuates the refugee situation from generation to generation to generation. He closed the Palestinian office in Washington. The PLO had broken off talks with, his, with the United States after the uh, movement of the embassy to Jerusalem, and he said, well, uh, we don't need to have you here. So he did that. Uh, he also ended American participation in UNESCO. Uh, and the reason for that was UNESCO made a decision that there was never any Jewish connection to Jerusalem or the Temple Mount. And obviously this was political and ahistorical, but President Trump, much to the light of the Israelis, seized the opportunity to do this. Also pulled out of the UN Human Rights Council, claiming it was, uh, quite correctly, very prejudiced against Israel. But the peak of what he did to make the Israelis happy was end American participation in the JCPOA, the nuclear agreement, with uh, Iran. This is something that Netanyahu had been pushing for for an extremely long period of time. And he went ahead and he did it. And he reimposed the sanctions that had been lifted uh, on Iran. Okay, you know, so far, so good. And I should mention, because of the very close ties between Netanyahu and Trump, before the first of what may be many Israeli elections in 2019, <laughs> he recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, which is a major plum. Didn't help Netanyahu too much in the election, but it was certainly nice to have. OK, so where's the problem? The problem is in part because of the volatility of the President of the United States. We saw this in a big way at the end of December 2018, when, after a telephone call with Recep Erdogan, who was the leader of Turkey, he abruptly announced pulling out of Syria. And his comments at the time were, at least to the Israelis, very scary. Oh, we're going to leave. Leave Syria to the Iranians, they can have it. Uh, and then, well, you know, I, I'm sure most everybody in here is familiar with the issue of Iran and Syria as far as Israel's concerned, but let me just repeat it. The Iranians are pretty far away from Israel. They can hit Israel maybe with missiles, but with some difficulty. If, however, they have bases in next door Syria, they can launch many closer missiles, missiles that can hit Israel from there. And Israel, over the last uh, period since 2011, has been trying to keep the Iranians from having a, foot, a foothold in Syria, including bombing Iranian positions. We just saw this the other day. So when President Trump says, oh, I'm going to leave Iran to the Syrians, there goes the tripwire. That the United St that Israel was hoping for, uh, that the United States would uh, would fill. Worse than this, he was asked after that. Well, you know, this is going to impinge on the security of the Israelis. Uh, 
So they said, no, don't worry, the Israelis can defend themselves. Uh, they get 4.8 billion, he got the numbers wrong, 4.8 billion dollars a year of military aid. So, you know, that had to be disturbing. What was more disturbing, however, came later in 2018 and 19. Because while some troops were left temporarily, at least, in, in northern Syria, by the way, this is what caused Defense Secretary Mattis to resign, the decision to abruptly pull out of, of Syria, uh, we saw Iranian attacks, first of all, against an American drone, expensive drone, almost a quarter of a billion dollars. No reaction from the United States. Attacks on tankers in the Persian Gulf. No reaction from the United States. Then attacks on oil installations in Saudi Arabia, major ally of the United States. Again, no reaction from the United States. All the time it appeared that President Trump was begging the Iranians to negotiate. And again, appetite grows with the eating. So while the Israelis had hoped that Netanyahu would be a real strong ally against Iran, that hope began increasingly to diminish. Meanwhile, on the home front, there were also problems. Historically, at least from 1967, the American Jewish community has been a bulwark of support for Israel. As a result of actions by Prime Minister Netanyahu, that support has been fractured. What happened? Well, first of all, his close identification with President Trump uh, was a very negative factor because 70 percent of American Jews did not vote for Trump. His proliferation of settlements, again, well over 70 percent of American Jews has polled oppose expansion of settlements on the West Bank. But there are also religious issues. After really hard negotiations about prayer space at the Western Wall, uh, in Jerusalem, the Western Wall, uh, right below the Temple Mount slash Haram al-Sharif, is the holiest place in Judaism. And it was under control of the ultra-Orthodox in Israel. There's a good push from conservative, reform Jews to have a, their own place to pray. So there's a lot of negotiations. Finally, an agreement was made uh, for prayer space for non-Orthodox Jews. And what happens? The ultra-Orthodox Jews, or Haredim, tell Netanyahu, if you agree to this, we're pulling out of the government, and your government will fall. So essentially, he reneged on this. So this was another issue. So now, as you pull this all together, we have an American Jewish community which is fractured, uh, whereas most of the Haredim or ultra-Orthodox and Orthodox in this country tend to support Trump. The 80 percent of American Jews who are not don't. So you have a split on this. You have a split on what was once a bipartisan support for Israel, Republicans and Democrats, I think at least until 2000, probably until 2009, when now increasingly, in large part thanks to Netanyahu, who embraced Mitt Romney, who embraced Trump, who embraced the Republicans, and made that speech despite Obama in this joint speech to Congress against the JCPOA, now you have in support of Israel, 78 percent Republicans, but only about 35 percent Democrats. And that's problematic. And that's basically where we are now. So let me offer, before we get to the Q&A, three scenarios of where we're going to go from here. Now remember, President Trump is under impeachment. And if you haven't heard Fiona Hill's uh, testimony today, please do so. Very, she's an old colleague of mine, so I've got to give her a plug. But she's very good and very, very articulate. So here, and of course, as 
Frank mentioned that we have Mr. Netanyahu under indictment for three different, under three different cases of bribery and malfeasance in office. Um, so will they survive? You know, we don't know. But I'm going to give you these three different scenarios that might happen, might not. I'm an optimist at heart. Even though I study the Middle East, I'm still, a, <laughs> still an optimist. I'm going to give you the best scenario first. Best scenario first is new leadership in the United States and new leadership in the state of Israel. New leadership in the United States, meaning a new president who talks not only to himself, but talks who, remember Mr. Trump said he's his best advisor, but talks to specialists to try to get their point of view, who values alliances and doesn't say NATO's dead, but, you know, values things like NATO, values an alliance such as with the Kurds. You know, 13,000 Kurds died to help us fight ISIS. Values the ties with Israel. So, you know, that's two. And three, doesn't make foreign policy in a morning tweet, but does it very, very carefully. So that's my dream scenario, an American president who doesn't do this. My other dream scenario, and that's my optimistic one, is for a new Israeli prime minister who is centrist, who is not dependent on the ultra-Orthodox, and who's open to negotiations with the Palestinians, which Mr. Netanyahu was not. So that's the optimistic scenario. The pessimistic scenario is that Mr. Trump will survive impeachment, survive the Senate, and get reelected. And Mr. Netanyahu, despite all the charges against him, will manage to escape the Supreme Court, you know, judgment where he, he's now appealing to the Supreme Court and stay in power. And if that happens, that's the worst scenario because you have the growing rift in America, the partisan rift on Israel, which in the long run, if only Republicans support Israel, is very bad for Israel. And if fewer and fewer American Jews support Israel, that's bad. And even with the evangelical support, some of the younger evangelicals we know by polls don't have the same support for Israel as the older ones. So it's bad on this side the same president, and then Mr. Netanyahu, if he stays in power, will continue to be dependent on right-wing nationalists to expand settlements, which will put to death any hope for a two-state solution, and, of course, will be dependent on the ultra-Orthodox, which means the gulf between American Jews and Israel will grow further. So that's the pessimistic scenario. I guess the scenario in the middle is there'll be changes in one government but not the other. So maybe a change in the American government, at least given the polls, if they can be trusted. Um, even if there isn't a change in the Israeli government, probably a new, especially if the Democrats take over, uh, won't have, Israel will not have the carte blanche to build settlements and, the, and expand existing settlements. Uh, so that will so hopefully salvage uh, a, a two-state solution. But why don't I, I know there have got to be a lot of questions, so let me stop here, turn it over to Frank, and then open for any questions you might have. Thank you, Bob, for another very clear and direct presentation. Yes, sir, in the rear. The, the question, of course, the wonderful question is, is uh, what would the Israelis do if, indeed, uh, the two-state solution is off the table? It poses an extremely negative choice for Israel. If you incorporate all the Palestinians who live on the West Bank, leave Gaza out for a minute, 10, 20, 25 years, there'll be more Palestinians in the state of Israel, counting the 20% of Israeli Arabs who are already there, than there are Jews. 
so they could simply vote away, since Israel is a democracy, could vote away a Jewish state. Alternatively, if they're not given the vote and the population continues to increase, then Jews will be a minority in an Arab country, but ruling, and Israel will begin to look like South Africa used to look like. That's the stark choice. And those who advocate a one-state solution have simply forgotten their history. There was a one-state solution under the mandate when the British had it in the 20s and 30s. And the two communities were at each other's throats during almost that entire period, especially in the 30s. So you have to separate them, and that's why I think a two-state solution is necessary. What is left with the United States out of Syria? OK, and its implications for Israel. Um, OK, well, right now, remember, we have multiple players in Syria. We have the Syrian regime responsible for 400,000 deaths and about 11 million displaced people, either internally displaced or living as refugees in Turkey or Jordan or Lebanon. Um, you have Russia, which has two major military bases, one a naval base in Tartus, the other an air base in Hamanum in, in, in Latakia. You have the Turks who occupy this northern strip, strip. You have the Americans now in the oil fields, whatever they're worth, in the, in the Far East and Deir al-Azur to try to control the highway between Iran, Iraq, and Syria. And of course, you have the Iranians who are providing foot soldiers for the Syrian regime uh, and also trying to establish military bases where they can hit Israel. So that's the complex now. Uh, right now, the Israelis are involved in rather heavy military action to prevent the Iranians from getting entrenched. The Syrian government forces are fighting the Turkish forces for control of the north because when the U.S turned its back on the Kurds, you remember. The Kurds went to the Syrians. Syrians have moved up to Kobani, which is a town in the north, and they are beginning to clash in a big way with Turkish forces. The Turks control an area called Idlib, where there happen to be a lot of jihadists, and they're using some of these jihadists to fight against the Kurds in the, in the northern part of the country. And the Russians are trying to manage all this especially with the Americans gone. Now, the best that Israel can hope for, I think, is that the Russians continue to give it freedom of action to hit the Iranians before the Iranians can establish very serious military bases to hit Israel. Now, you also talked about Lebanon. You're familiar with the riots going on in Lebanon. Yeah. Hezbollah effectively took over the country in 2008 and took over the politics of the country uh, last year. It's blame for the lack of cleaning the garbage, et cetera. So its position is weakening even as there are problems with the Iranian government with riots over food, et cetera. So I think it's, it's a case for the Israelis in Syria and Lebanon not so much to solve the problem, but to manage it. And that's what they're doing now. The question is what's left for the United States to do? Uh, toward a two-state solution. Yeah, if there was a sane president, I believe I heard you say. Um, well, first of all, the decision that settlements were illegal were made by the, was made by the Carter administration in 1978, and more or less adhered to. Ronald Reagan backed away from it, but it certainly was something embraced by the Obama administration. Well, once again, go back and say, settlement expansion, construction on the West Bank is illegal. That would be the very first thing to do. Now, there are also some dangerous things that one hears. The, as most everybody in here knows, the Democratic Party has moved to the left. And some of the extreme leftists are saying, you've got to cut off military aid to Israel to get them to obey stuff. Now, Biden did not say that. He, oppose that, but you're beginning to hear people like Warren and, and people like Bernie making these comments. Baron Bernie says, I'm a real friend of Israel. He's Jewish, big friend of Israel, but uh, 
you know. So, you know, the military aid, especially if you have to fight the Iranians, is critical. So what I think you can do is not stop the military aid, but, you know, there are things, you know, if, if you have an Israeli prime minister who wants to get credit at home by visiting the United States and getting embraced by the American president, you don't invite him or her. Uh, I mean, for those of you following the impeachment things, this was exactly what the Ukrainian Zelensky wanted, because he wanted to get support from the United States, which would beef him up at home and ha let him stand stronger against the Russians. Well, then you, you do things like that. Is it Gantz's time? Yeah, Gantz's time actually was yesterday. His time <laughs> ran out. In other words, if you are a potential former, uh, for, former of an Israeli coalition government. The president selects you. First, he selected Netanyahu, gave Netanyahu 28 days. He couldn't put a government together. <laughs> then he gave it to Gantz. Gantz had 28 days, and he couldn't do it either. So right now, we have 21 days in which any member of the Israeli parliament can try to form a coalition and come tell President Rivlin, I've got the numbers. And if they're lucky enough to do it, it'd be interesting. Um, what Gantz has been saying and why he opposes a national unity government is that he doesn't want to serve as Labor and Likud and Blue and White or Kohova Lavan together have 65. You need 61 to run a government. So the National Union government would make a lot of sense. But Gantz's argument has been, I don't want to be number two to Netanyahu, and I can't trust Netanyahu to give up power when it's his turn. If somebody else should arise in Likud, however, and Gideon Saar, by the way, some of you may have noticed through his ad in the ring today, is a very popular Likud person, and he's calling for immediate Likud uh, primary elections. So if he got it, then conceivably he could quickly form the government with Gantz, and then you'd have a national unity government. Whether he can pull this off in 21 days, whether Netanyahu will allow a primary in 21 days is a very open question, but that's one possibility. What uh, group of uh, Palestinians can Israel negotiate with? Okay, you're quite right. There are two different Palestinian governments, one in Gaza and one in the West Bank. The Israelis made a mistake in 2014 when there were serious unity talks between Gaza and the West Bank Palestinian Authority, because the only way you're ever going to have peace is for there to be a unified Gaza-West Bank negotiating team. And one obvious requirement of that is for that team to be willing to make peace with Israel. And that, that has to be negotiated out between, with, among the Palestinians. Because if you make a deal only with Abbas, and you're quite right, Hamas is going to shoot it down. So that speaks for a possibility that if we want to talk about negative scenarios or bloody scenarios, um, Every so often, every couple of years, there's a war between Israel and Hamas. And in each of these wars, the rockets from Hamas are getting closer and closer to Tel Aviv. Now, Benny Gantz, among others, have been saying that you have constant rocket fire and kites, burning kites coming over the border and setting up, setting fires in Israeli agricultural communities. And what you have to do is eliminate that once and for all. So one scenario that I see, which would answer your question, is that the Israelis would go into Gaza, eliminate Hamas and Islamic Jihad at the same time. It'll be bloody, and then give over once again to the Palestinian Authority, which lost control of Gaza in 2007, control Hamas is sufficiently unpopular now in Gaza because the standard of living is so bad that um, 
Palestinian Authority, assuming it has a new leader, because Abbas is 82. And it's a question is who's going to take over after him. Um, that might be one way of solving the problem. It won't be clean, but it's a way to solve it. Why do Palestinians not get compensation for land that they've lost uh, since the 1940s? Well, par part of the problem was that in 1948, five Arab armies invaded the newly created state of Israel. And as a result, one of the results of that was the refugee problem. But there's more to it than that. The other part of it is that you had 750,000 Jews who fled from Arab countries who didn't get compensation for all the property they left behind. And we're talking about Iraq and talking about Syria and places like that. So one of the ideas of a final peace agreement is to put all the Palestinian claims on one side of the table and all the claims of the Jews who fled from Arab countries on the other side of the table and see if then everybody can get compensated. That, I think, is going to be the best way to do it. How and when? How and when? <laughs> You've got to get my more, you're obviously, if you have scenario three that I discussed, the worst one, it's not going to happen. But if you have the, the new scenario, then it is quite possible. And if, if people were actually talking about just this in the 1990s, after Oslo II, and there looked to be uh, a possibility of movement toward peace, and people were talking about reimbursing Palestinians and reimbursing Jews who fled from Arab countries. With the Second Intifada uh, and with the various wars with Hamas, that's going down the drain. But hopefully, that's an idea that can be reignited, so you pay off both sides. You're, you're concerned about the resolution of what? The conflict. Ah, okay. <laughs> you, you, have, you have two minutes to solve the situation. <laughs> okay. I think I have seven, but I'll only take two. Okay. Um, I went to Tunis to meet with Arafat when he was in exile in, in 1989 after he said the magic words that I recognize Israel, I'm renouncing terrorism, I'm willing to live in peace with Israel. So as part of Brookings Institution delegation that had made uh, peace with, between Egypt and Israel, the Deputy Secretary of State at the time, Hal Saunders, who was responsible for the peace between Israel and Egypt at Camp David, who helped uh, Jimmy Carter, the National Security Advisor, Bill Quant, the American Ambassador to Egypt, Herman Eiltz, they were on the delegation of three academics, of which I was one. So we met with Arafat, and we met with his entourage to see if he was serious about peace. Came out of that meeting thinking at least test him and see if he's serious about peace. Uh, unfortunately, there was an Israeli prime minister named Shamir who was not about to test them. However, when Yitzhak Rabin came in in 92, he was willing to test him. And that led to Oslo I and then the Oslo II agreement. The dilemma was, of course, terrorism and end of conflict. Arafat was unwilling to stop the terrorism, and he was unwilling to pronounce if there's an agreement, it's not going to be our final end of our claims. And on that, it died. And then at Camp David II, if you remember, in, uh, that Bill Clinton tried to negotiate Arafat made the statement there never was a Jewish temple on the Temple Mount slash Haram al-Sharif, and that killed it. And then comes the second intifada and bombs in, in supermarkets, in coffee shops, in a pizza parlor that I used to go to in Jerusalem, uh, and that kind of thing. And that moved the entire Israeli population to the right. And that's, of course, what Netanyahu was able to capitalize on and has been capitalizing on it for the last 10 years. That's why you've got to shift it back again. Now, the good news of this, if one has some good news in here, is that the Arab League, first in 2002, but nobody took it seriously, but in 2013 said, we're willing to make peace with Israel if it goes back to the 1967 borders with land swaps, 
Now, what that means is Israel has a chance, besides the peace that it has with Jordan and Egypt, cold pieces, but still peace, to spread that peace out to the rest of the Arab world. So far, we haven't had a single Israeli prime minister willing to take that up. However, if you go with my optimistic scenario, and you have Benny Gantz, it is quite possible that we might begin to see movement in that direction. And that is a cause of optimism. You had mentioned the possibility of uh, Hamas being taken out by Israel. How would the international community respond? Well, let's define the international community first, and then we'll see. The Egyptians would be delighted because Hamas is a Muslim Brotherhood organization. And of course, General Sisi, the current dictator of Egypt, came in in a popular but still military coup against the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay. Turkey will be very angry because it is now the bastion of the Muslim Brotherhood, but its cloud in the Middle East is not particularly large. Iran will be unhappy. The Saudis don't like the Muslim Brotherhood either, nor do the UAE, United Arab Emirates, so they would not be unhappy if Israel did it. Let's go to Europe. Uh, the British and the French and the, possibly the Germans would be unhappy, but they don't count for anything, quite honestly. I mean, seriously. So you're basically at the United States, and, and China is apolitical. So you're at the United States and Russia. Uh, if it's Trump, okay, Trump will cheer the Israelis on. Uh, the Russians are playing a double game. The Russians have entertained Hamas delegations in Moscow, have tried to forge cooperation between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, but at the same time have $3 billion a year in trade with Israel. Putin says that Israel is the largest Russian-speaking area outside the former Soviet Union, and we prize fellow Russian speakers. Israel provides nanotechnology to the Russians, which they need, as well as very good agricultural technology. So the Russians may hem and haw, et cetera. If Obama were still president, he would complain. If Trump remains president, he won't complain. In fact, he'll probably cheer them on. So in other words, I wouldn't worry too much about the international community if Israel does it. The only country I would worry about is Jordan. Jordan half of Jordan's population is Palestinian. And the diplomatic relations are sort of hanging by a thread between Israel and Jordan now. It could be a temporary break if this happens. Would you comment on the relationship between Israel and Turkey? Okay. Now, I could really give a cop out and say there's a wonderful chapter in my new book coming yeah. out <laughs> on Turkey and Israel. But uh, I can summarize what, what my colleague Mark Haas, who wrote the chapter, said. And, my own feelings as well. In the late 1990s, there was a real strategic interest between Israel and Turkey. Both were opposed to Syria. The Syrians were, sp uh, were sponsoring the PKK, which is a terrorist group, launching attacks on the Turks. And the Turks threatened to invade. The Syrians were very worried because if they concentrated their troops in the north, then Israel's right there in the south. So they gave in and handed over the uh, PKK leader. Okay, what's changed? Well, in the late 90s, there was a secularist government in Turkey. Now there's a real Islamist government in Turkey. And Erdogan wants to be the new sultan. He's sort of neo-Ottoman. His hero is, if this name sounds familiar, Sultan Hamid II. Sultan Hamid was the last caliph of the Ottoman Empire, last Islamic leader who played the Islamic card. And Erdogan is playing the Islamic card in a big way. And he's backing Hamas, uh, despite the fact that the Turks have killed, forget about how many Armenians, how many tens of thousands of Kurds uh, in its war, they criticize Israel when Israel attacks um, uh, Hamas, which Israel did in 2008, and Erdogan launched a massive attack. Then he sponsored 
this flotilla, which tried to break the blockade of Gaza, and nine Turks were killed in that process, and that was a real issue. And relations in almost all areas have gone down ever since, except trade. There's still $2 billion a year in trade between Israel and Turkey. Um, but Israel no longer has its pilots fly over Turkish airspace, no longer gets intelligence on Iran from Turkey the way it used to, and Turkey no longer has the benefit of the uh, pro-Israeli lobby in the United States to improve its position uh, in the United States. And not accidentally, the House just voted finally to recognize the Armenian genocide. And this would not have happened I think had Turkey and Israel still had very good relations. So, Jordanian government and uh, uh, Palestinians on the West Bank. All right, there's a long history there. Um, and we have to separate out the regime from the population. You have a large percentage, upwards of 50% of the Jordanian population is Palestinian, who either left after 1948 or left after 1967. They control a good part of the economy, pharmaceuticals, et cetera, in the country. But the native Jordanians, if I hesitate to use that term because they literally came out of the desert 40 years after the Zionists came in, in, uh, in 1921, um, control security. So the king's grandfather, Abdullah I, had good relations with the state of Israel because despite the fact that Jordan invaded in 1948, they both had the same enemy and that was the Mufti, the Palestinian leader. Because King Abdullah I wanted to control what the UN had promised to be the Palestinian state out of the mandate. Remember in 1947, you had a UN vote establishing a Jewish state in Palestine and an Arab state in Palestine. And Abdullah wanted the Arab state for himself to expand Transjordan to a larger Jordan, and the British backed him up. So you had that kind of relationship. Then there were periodic attempts to overthrow his grandson, King Hussein. The Israelis provided security information to support him. Then the king got, had no choice because of popular fervor but to get involved in the 67 war, and he lost the West Bank, and he lost Jerusalem, and he lost the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif. In the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan in 1994, one of the provisions was that Jordan would have special responsibility for the holy places in Jerusalem, which means the Dome of the Rock, uh, you know, and that area up there, which he gilded, by the way, uh, he, he gilded the Dome of the Rock. So that's important to Jordan as an element of prestige, and it lets Jordan play a larger role in the Arab world and the Middle East. What happens? It's a very narrow wedge up there. If you've been up to the Temple Mount, again, Haram al-Sharif, which is the Muslim word, it's the only open space the Arabs have in East Jerusalem, really. So you can go up there, you have Boy Scout groups and other groups going up there. Um, but then there's a question whether Jews can pray up there because that used to be the spot of the former yeah. Jewish temple. And originally, the decision was made by the Orthodox leadership. Jews could not pray up there because you don't know where the Holy of Holies of the temple was. And you don't want to profane it by accidentally s standing on it. However. That changed over time as the more radical uh, religious Zionists felt they have a, every bit of right to pray up there as the Muslims do. But when that happens and you have clashes between the Muslim authorities and the religious Zionists, King Abdullah II feels he has to intervene. Why? Because one of the important parties in Jordan is something called the Islamic Action Front, which is a wing of the Muslim Brotherhood. And if he didn't react, you're weak on Jerusalem. Right. And that would threaten a shaky rule. So you have this, at the same time you have economic cooperation in something called qualified industrial zones, set up, by the way, by the United States. 
where it's primarily Jewish capital or Israeli capital and labor from Jordan making clothing. It's then exported to the United States and entries do, enters duty free. And because of the high percentage of Jordanian joblessness, this is actually important. But there are real problems, again, in the relationship. So security-wise at the top, it's excellent. The Israelis have helped the Jordanians. Uh, they're building and built dams to provide water. Now they're going to sell natural gas. But people to people, no. Uh, there's too much popular anti-Israel stuff there. The Israelis at this point are satisfied, as with Egypt, let's have good security cooperation. That protects the country. That's the main thing. The question is, depending upon uh, what his political circumstances are, what are the implications for the political case? Okay, legal case. He's trying to get Knesset, the Israeli parliament, to pass a law which says a sitting Israeli prime minister who's indicted cannot be ousted. He tried to do that before. He couldn't do it. That, that was one of the things that was a barrier to forming a national unity government. If somebody else forms the government and he's no longer prime minister, he's indicted and will probably go to jail. He's right now appealing to the Israeli High Court of Justice, which is the Supreme Court. So once he's out of power, he's in deep trouble. And I, I must say on a personal note, he was convicted on three cases. He should have been convicted on a fourth case. The fourth case was, I don't know if you're familiar with this, folks. The Israelis decided to buy four, uh, three new submarines uh, from Germany, as well as fast patrol boats to protect the Israeli offshore natural gas facilities, um, which has made Israel not only self-sufficient in gas, but able to export it to Jordan and Egypt. So the question is, you put out a tender, and whoever comes in with the best price and the best specifications, you all know how this works. Well, all of a sudden, Netanyahu said, no tenders. I want this German firm to get the bids. The German firm happened to be represented in Israel by Netanyahu's lawyer. Well, that smells a bit. Uh, and he wasn't convicted on this, but he was convicted on all sorts of other bribery cases. So once he's out of office, he's in deep trouble. And the question is, what is the European Union's position on this? European Union is going through lots of problems. I once had a chance to talk to the foreign minister of the European Union and asked him, how do you get a unified position? And he said, it's hard because you've got to negotiate with all 29 states. <laughs> Meanwhile, with Britain pulling out and Macron, who is the, you know, French president, not willing to entertain the possibility of either Albania or North Macedonia to enter into the EU, the real internal structural problems. So given those dynamics, I would say as a block, the EU does not have very much clout. So you're talking about France and Germany, basically. You've uh, tapped a bit of Professor Friedman's <laughs> knowledge, and on another occasion, we'll get more. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bob.